Hey everybody, welcome back. This is part two of our series going over MRI reports. And in this video, we're gonna take a look at two MRI reports going over a different type of shoulder injury than we did in part one. In this part, we're gonna go over more of a traumatic type of injury, uh, specifically uh, a shoulder dislocation type injury where we see injury patterns as a result of uh, shoulder dislocations and things like that. It'll also go over some uh, terminology that you might see in other types of MRI reports for other types of shoulder injuries. And some of that terminology will uh, be applicable to those types of reports as well. So in part one, some of the reporting that we saw on those MRIs were more typical in patients in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, and even older. In this part two, these reports we tend to see in a younger age group uh, with more types of traumatic type of injuries. Okay, so in this first MRI report, um, we're going to start off from the top and we're going to work our way down, really just going over everything in this particular report. So at the very top, we'll see MRI. So obviously this tells you what type of study it is. And this is an MRI of the shoulder, a right shoulder, and this is done without contrast. And they're referring to something called gadolinium, which is uh, injected, um, can be injected into the shoulder joint within the joint, and that would be an MRI with contrast. And uh, this particular one does not have contrast, but in certain cases, adding that contrast can help uh, show different types of pathology uh, a little bit more clearly. So that is uh, usually just injury or situation specific. And so as we go further down, we'll just go down to this uh, area here, clinical history. And so this patient had right shoulder pain, had an injury, shoulder trauma. Um, they, uh, when the MRI is ordered, they add some uh, rationale for the study. There's a code here for that. Um, and so that really just provides really the, uh, some indication to actually get the MRI uh, ordered. And so this next topic here, technique, uh, they're saying this is, is a standard multiplanar uh, MRI. What they mean by multiplanar is that the MRI scan is uh, taken and different images uh, from different perspectives on the shoulder, looking at the front, top to the side, are performed. Um, and so they go on to the findings here. So in this uh, next section, they'll talk about the specific findings in the MRI. And then later on, they usually have a, a summary of that. And so the radiologist puts in the report here. Different radiologists put in reports a little bit differently. Uh, every radiologist seems to have their own particular style. And uh, so there might be a little bit of variation to this uh, compared to perhaps your MRI. So here they start off with the rotator cuff. They say it's unremarkable. Uh, it doesn't look like there's an injury or anything like that. They say there's no full thickness or significant focal partial thickness tear identified. So essentially the rotator cuff, the four, uh, four muscles in the rotator cuff in the shoulder, they don't see an injury uh, to, that MR, uh, to that rotator cuff. They specifically comment next on the musculature. They say there's mild edema. Uh, edema, they mean there's some fluid uh, within the muscle, and uh, that could be for different reasons. In this particular patient where we suspect an injury, uh, you would expect to see something like edema, some sort of uh, fluid uh, reaction, um, perhaps even like blood uh, around the area. They see small, low-grade, partial interstitial tears at the lateral deltoid muscle. So the deltoid is the big muscle here on the side of the shoulder. They see a little bit of tearing within that muscle belly. They note mild patchy edema of the subscapularis. And so what they mean by patchy is that it's sort of um, just kind of uh, 
sparse within the muscle itself, and then this is actually within the subscapularis muscle, which is the, uh, one of the four rotator cuff tendons. And they actually also see it in the infraspinatus muscle as well, and the infraspinatus is another rotator cuff muscle. And then they make note the remaining muscles are within normal limits. So within normal limits is medical jargon for everything seems fine. Uh, they make a topic. Uh, they have a topic here for bursitis. Bursitis is uh, well, a bursa is a low friction tissue layer that's usually between two other layers, like between a muscle and um, another muscle layer or muscle bone, perhaps. And it just allows the gliding of those muscle of, of those two tissue layers. So, for example, on my elbow. Um, there is a bursa here between the skin and the elbow uh, and the bone of my elbow. And so you can see how that's loose right there. And so that allows uh, the gliding of that skin over that bone. And so that's what a bursa does. Um, with repetitive motion, that can get really inflamed. And that's what bursitis is. Here they see mild subcoracoid bursitis. So the coracoid process is... Um, a small uh, muscle, um, I'm sorry, a small bony protrusion here on the front of the shoulder, that's the coracoid. And so they're saying that they see bursitis in the area just below it. And so the area just below the coracoid process is the subscapularis tendon. And so uh, they're referring to this bursa in particular. All right, they move on to the long head of the biceps tendon. The long head of the biceps, or actually the biceps muscle itself, there's two attachment points up in the shoulder. One is actually to this uh, coracoid process, that's the uh, short head of the biceps, and the long head of the biceps is um, uh, actually dives in and attaches deep, to the deep inside the shoulder socket. And so this would uh, represent the long head of the biceps as it runs up the arm bone and dives deep into the shoulder socket. They say that that structure looks intact and normal in appearance. Moving down, now we're getting to the area where there's a lot of injury involved. And so they specifically point out the labrum and the glenohumeral ligaments. And so the labrum uh, is a structure uh, is a is, is a, uh, a structure of cartilage essentially that surrounds the shoulder socket. And so here's my shoulder model again with the uh, arm bone removed. And if we peel back the muscles here, we can see the socket deep inside the shoulder just like that. And so, the, and so the labrum actually surrounds the socket right here. And so I actually got online and tried to find some good model examples of that, and there really weren't any, so I just made my own. And so, um, so imagine this is the shoulder socket, and the ball sits on top of the shoulder just like that, the ball and socket joint. And so if we show you the socket uh, face on like this, you can see this represents the cartilage, and then the labrum is this bump, this, uh, this uh, circular structure that lays right on top of the socket right there. So that's the labrum. And then the glenohumeral ligaments are essentially stabilizer ligaments to the, um, uh, to the shoulder, so they, they go from essentially the, uh, the shoulder socket to the arm bone and uh, those are referred to as the glenohumeral ligaments. And so they make note that there's a bank art tear with a vulsion of the anterior inferior labral ligamentous complex. And so big, big words uh, right there. So a bank art tear refers to a, uh, so if this is back to our shoulder socket, say this is the front, this is the back, and what they're seeing is in the front of the shoulder, for example, they see a bank art tear. And so a bank art tear is when the labrum is actually torn, just like this, is actually torn away from the socket. 
just like that. So that would be a bank art tear. And then they say avulsion of the anterior inferior labral ligamentous complex. And so the ligaments, here's our uh, ball and socket joint. The ligaments go from the arm bone right below the ball part of the socket and actually attach to this labral structure here. And so when they say avulsion of the anterior inferior labral ligamentous complex, they're saying that there's the bank art tear, the labral tear, with its associated ligaments that are attached, has totally pulled off this socket here. That's what they mean by an avulsion. So it's just all, all, all of that is pulled off. They then see multiple adjacent displaced labral ligamentous fragments in the axillary recess. And so this injury was so bad that some of the, uh, some of the labrum is actually torn loose and come off uh, its attachment and is actually floating around inside the shoulder. The axillary recess is just um, essentially a space within the shoulder joint where fragments of tissue can collect. They see a detached, non-displaced tear of the posterior labrum near the eight to nine o'clock position on the glenoid. Okay, so we said earlier that if this is the front of our shoulder here, the front of our socket, there's a tear, a bank art tear here, but the injury was so bad that the tear actually began to extend from the front all around to the back, and so not only is there a tear in the front like this, where this is torn loose, but it extends all the way to the back right here. And then when they refer to the eight uh, to nine o'clock position on the glenoid, because the glenoid is essentially circular in shape, to help explain the location of the labral tear, we'll actually use it like a clock face. So, if we're looking straight on this socket right here, if we look at it like, if I'm looking at it like this and you're looking at it like that on the camera, what we can say here is this area here would be, let's say three o'clock. And as we march our way down, that would be six o'clock. And as we march our way around, that would be nine o'clock. And if we go all the way back up to the top, that would be the 12 o'clock position. And so when they say near the eight to nine o'clock position, they're saying that the tear extends essentially all the way around from like a three o'clock position to a nine o'clock position on the socket. Moving down to bones and joints. And so they see a small, mildly impacted hill sacs fracture and bone contusion of the posterior lateral humeral head. Okay, so this is an important concept. So a hill sax is what happens to the actual ball part of the shoulder socket when it comes out of place. And so I've got another uh, model here that will explain this. And so if we go back to our shoulder socket model, when the ball dislocates off the socket like this. What you can see is that there's edge loading right here where the ball meets the edge of the socket, the glenoid. And that bone tends to be pretty hard or hard enough to where when the ball comes over the socket, you can actually get an indentation in the ball right there as it rolls off the edge. So the, the, so the ball dislocates and then it impacts onto the edge of the socket just like that. That impaction, let me see if I can get a good picture for you guys, that impaction on the ball of the humeral head, essentially, is called a hill sax, a hill sax lesion or a hill sax fracture. Of course, when the, the bone takes a hit like that, it's gonna cause a contusion. So that's what he's pointing out here, the radiologist. They see a small partial chondral defect and questionable small non-displaced subchondral fracture involving the more medial aspect of the posterior humeral head with underlying bone marrow edema. And so what they're referring to here is 
when we see the uh, when we have the ball in the socket joint, of course there's cartilage on that, and so just the nature of this injury has caused a cartilage defect on the humeral head of the uh, of the uh, he, uh, the shoulder joint. Um, here they make special note a small non-displaced subchondral fracture. So subchondral fracture is a special type of fracture, not like when you have, let's say, your arm bone and it just snaps in two. A subchondral fracture is more when you get this um, impaction type injury. So if we have the smooth joint surface of the, uh, the humeral head, the ball of the socket, when that gets impacted in, so if this is the joint surface, if that gets impacted in and you get a crack just below the joint surface, that's what they refer to as a subchondral fracture. Mild underlying marrow edema. So the marrow, the bone marrow, that is the um, more the deeper aspect of the bone. They see um, edema in the area. Essentially, the injury has caused a fluid influx into that area. Uh, and that could be blood and things like that. They see a small full thickness delaminating chondral defect of the anterior inferior glenoid with mild marrow edema. And so we'll again go back to our shoulder model. I have a, another model here that shows an injury. So when the ball comes forward on the socket, you get this shearing motion. And so instead of having nice smooth cartilage like this, what you'll have is the ball comes out of the shoulder socket and actually shears some of that cartilage off. And so that's what they mean by a delaminating chondral defect. The cartilage is delaminating, shearing off. And in one particular area, it looks like it's full thickness, meaning the cartilage layer in that particular area has totally sheared off. And then they see it along the anterior inferior glenoid. That's the location of the injury. And so typically when the, uh, the shoulder joint comes out of place towards the front, that happens along the, not only the front of the shoulder, but actually the more lower position on the socket. And that's, that's what they're uh, referring to there. They see no bank art fracture identified and a bank art fracture, as opposed to a tear, is actually, instead of tearing the labrum off only, in really bad cases, you can actually just fracture a segment of the socket off together as a whole piece. And so that would be considered a bank art fracture. Small full thickness chondral defects in mild marrow edema of the posterior glenoid. That just means that towards the back of the shoulder socket, they see some areas where the cartilage is also banged up in that location. We see a moderate glenohumeral joint effusion. The glenohumeral joint is the uh, ball and socket shoulder joint, and in an effusion can be any fluid that builds up in it. Uh, if there's blood in the shoulder joint, we refer to that as a heme arthrosis. They say joint alignment is within normal limits. So when the patient had their injury, they, they dislocated their shoulder joint, but whether it happened on the football field or the emergency room, his shoulder joint was popped back into place and that's where it is right now. And so when, he, when the patient went through the MRI scanner, his shoulder joint wasn't dislocated. And so they're just saying that the joint alignment is within normal limits. The acromioclavicular joint is normal in alignment and appearance. And so the acromioclavicular joint is where the collarbone joint right here meets the shoulder blade. And there's a small joint there called the acromioclavicular joint. And so there's no injury to that structure. And then they say here the acromial arch, type one acromion without downsloping. Uh, really, they're just referring to a 
part of the shoulder blade uh, right here. This is called the acromion, and this is sort of the roof above the rotator cuff. That's the acromion, and there's different ways to categorize the shape for various reasons. And um, every, different people have different shapes. It's often, often not very meaningful in these particular clinical situations. And the radiologist is just pointing out what that looks like. And then finally, they're referring to no os uh, That refers to um, a, essentially almost like a growth plate uh, when somebody's skeletally immature along the acromion. And right here in the front, sometimes that will not totally fuse with the rest of the shoulder blade, uh, meaning that there's still uh, some cartilage there, and it's just not like a, a complete bony, um, it doesn't fully bony form, and, uh, and so, but they don't see that in this patient. Um, sometimes it can become a problem, sometimes not, it just depends on uh, the patient. And so that pretty much goes over everything in this report. And then finally, the radiologist adds an impression. And that impression goes over uh, everything that he just outlined above. And he just summarizes it uh, uh, for us. OK, so that concludes case one. And we'll move on to case two. All right, so we're going to go over case two now. Uh, again, this is a MRI of the shoulder. It's a right shoulder. It seems like all of my MRIs are right shoulders for some reason, or most of them. But this one says, uh, there's a W here that stands for with, and this is with contrast. And so this is referred to as an arthrogram, and that means that prior to the MRI scan, the radiologist put a needle inside the shoulder joint and filled it with this contrast. And that contrast is gadolinium, and so that will diffuse through the joint, and it makes it easier to see certain structures like the labrum uh, and things like that. And so in the right clinical situation, it's, uh, it's often helpful to add that. And so in this patient, under his clinical history, again, we see this code and the rationale for the study and what we see here is instability, right shoulder, shoulder pain, and a history of recurrent dislocation. And so this is a very critical part of the patient's history. In the first case, this, uh, that particular situation, the patient had a first time shoulder dislocation, meaning it had come out, as far as we know, once, and, and it caused all that damage. In this particular patient, they had been having instability to the shoulder where the shoulder joint would dislocate and because of the patient's young age because of their activity level uh, they would be at high risk for it to happen over and over and over again and because that it's happening over and over again you start seeing worsening findings on the MRI scan so under the technique, again, we see multiplanar, meaning that they're taking multiple uh, fields of view, multiple perspectives from the front, top, to the side of the shoulder joint. Um, they mentioned 1.5 Tesla magnet. That's just the type of MRI scanner. And then here they see intraarticular contrast. And so that's what we were referring to earlier, where they put the contrast inside the shoulder joint. Um, in this case, they do make a mention of the of comparison studies, and so this patient had a, a radiograph or an x-ray uh, from May of 2022 that was available to the radiologist to also look at uh, when providing the report. And so moving on to the findings here, we see the rotator cuff and the supraspinatus infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis tendons are intact and demonstrate normal signal intensity. And so the radiologist has outlined all four rotator cuff tendons here, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and the subscapularis. There's normal signal, meaning that they have a normal appearance on the MRI, and the muscle looks normal. Uh, in volume, meaning there's no atrophy, there's no 
chronic change to the muscle that would cause atrophy and the muscle signal is good and signal refers to the appearance of the muscle on the MRI. Uh, an abnormal signal could represent a lot of different things that could represent trauma that could represent neurological injuries or other types of things, um, other pathology. And, uh, the radiologist says that that is normal, normal signal. Uh, they make a note of the biceps here. So again, they see the long and short heads of the biceps tendon are intact. So remember we have the uh, two heads of the biceps. We've got the short head, which uh, attaches up at your shoulder at the coracoid process, and you have the long head, which runs up and dives deep into the shoulder socket. And so both those parts of the biceps look intact, look okay, normal signal intensity. The long head is located within the groove. And so this is, um, this is an important concept. When the long head of the biceps runs up and dives into the shoulder joint. We'll demonstrate here. So here's our, our humerus, just like that. And what you'll notice here in the front, I'll turn it this way so you can see, you can see right here, there's a groove. And that groove here is where the biceps, the long head of the biceps tendon runs up and then dives into the shoulder socket. So that's the groove. And so in certain types of injuries, you can actually have that biceps tendon snap in and out of the groove. Here in this patient, we don't see that. They say that the long head is located within its groove, and so that's what they're referring to. Labrum and capsule. So they see here a subtle osseous bank art with associated anterior inferior labral tear. And so in this patient, like we mentioned before, here's our shoulder model, and here's our humeral head. This patient had their uh, shoulder joint dislocate out the front, and what they're referring to is when that happened, they actually broke off a small piece of bone off the socket. That's what they mean by a subtle osseous bank heart. And then there's an associated anterior inferior labral tear. And so in addition to the sm a small fracture of the socket here, they tore off a small piece of the labrum with it. Mild blunting and fraying of the posterior inferior labrum. And so if we have our shoulder socket, here's the front, anterior, here's the back, posterior, and they say that there's blunting of the labrum in the back here. With really what they're just referring to is the, um, is what we call the, the height of the labrum. So again, again, using the model for education, we can see that there's a bit of a bumper here where the labrum is. And so when they say blunting, there's not as much of that bumper. It's, it's, it's not quite as high up. There's not as much of a bumper effect there. And there's some fraying of the labrum there. So you can imagine what that looks like, just uh, uh, some small areas of tearing. But he's, uh, but of note, he is not mentioning that there's any detachment of the labrum in that area. It's just frayed in that area. There's no capsular thickening or edema. And so between the, uh, the humeral head and this uh, glenoid, there is the capsule. So that's the inner lining of the shoulder joint. And that doesn't look thick, uh, thicker than normal, I guess I should say. Uh, which you might see in cases of inflammation or something called a frozen shoulder. And uh, they also say there's no edema there, so that looks normal. In the intraarticular space, the glenohumeral joint is, the glenohumeral joint is adequately distended with intraarticular contrast. And so this is just a, a technical analysis really here. He's just reporting that they were able to get a good amount of that contrast dye within the shoulder joint uh, to, get a, to get a good study. And then here we make note of osseous and chondral structures. And then he sees a 2.3 by 2 by 2 centimeter acute or subacute on chronic. Let me re-highlight that. Acute or subacute on chronic Hillsax lesion. And so he's providing measurements of a Hillsax lesion. 
And so if we go back to our model here, so remember when the, uh, the hemal head dislocates out of the socket, it will create an edge loading effect just like that. And it will create an uh, indentation on the humeral head. That is a hill sax. And so the dimensions that he's referring to is actually measuring the size of that hill sax uh, defect. And as you can imagine, uh, it, there's some bone marrow edema. So that just means that the bone took a hit, took a contusion, like you would expect to create a impact into the head like that. Now, interesting, he makes a note of acute or subacute. So what he's saying is that it looks like this injury happened recently or uh, soon after. And then he says on chronic, so acute or subacute on chronic. So it looks like this patient has had an older defect and then he had an injury on top of that older defect. So if he had a shoulder dislocation before, which created the injury to begin with, and then the shoulder got popped back into place, he kept playing football or whatever, and then his shoulder re-dislocated and hit it again, that would be acute or subacute on top of a chronic pre-existing injury. He sees here high grade partial to full thickness chondral loss along the anterior inferior glenoid. And so you can definitely start to get the impression that this has been going on for a while. So this, this patient's ball has kept going over and over and over, dislocating multiple times. And now what's happening is instead of smooth, instead of smooth cartilage here, what we're getting is rough cartilage that's getting sheared off as the ball keeps coming out of socket. You can see how that would create an unstable situation. So we've got a defect on the, on the humeral head, and now we've got a defect on the socket where the ball doesn't have as much room to balance on the socket here. And then it doesn't take much to get the ball to kind of hit the edge and then off it goes. And then what can also happen is the defect on the humeral head can actually lock onto this edge here of the socket and then your shoulder joint's locked and you can't get it popped back in place. Let's see, soft tissue. So there's no evidence of abnormal bursal fluid. Again, we talked about the bursa, that low friction tissue layer, that all looks fine. And then he makes a note of the suprascapular notch and the spinoglenoid notch in the quadrilateral space. Those three, those three areas refer to um, specific anatomical regions of the uh, scapula. So the suprascapular notch is kind of deep, um, deep in the shoulder blade here. And the spinoglenoid notch is also uh, a little bit further back in this area. And those are important areas because uh, that's where an important nerve traverses the uh, shoulder joint and turns on some of the muscles of the rotator cuff. And then finally, the quadrilateral space is a space where there's um, where some nerves pass through and things like that, but uh, all that area looks okay. There's no solid or cystic soft tissue mass, um, no tumors or anything like that, or cysts that they see. And then the acromioclavicular joint, like we mentioned before, where the, where the collarbone meets the shoulder blade bone, that's the acromioclavicular joint, just a small joint right there. It appears unremarkable. And then finally, the acromioclavicular ligaments are intact. And so right where that joint meets up, there are some stabilizing ligament structures in that location that helps stabilize the collarbone on that joint and they don't see any injury to those. And that's what he means by there is no evidence of separation, separation of that part of the shoulder. And then finally, he provides the impression, which is just a, a summary of all the findings above. And so what he says here is a sequela of recent anterior shoulder dislocation with osseous labral and cartilaginous abnormalities.
And so that's a really fancy medical way of saying everything that I see on this MRI report supports the fact that this, or supports that this patient's shoulder has dislocated and it's dislocated more than once causing further injury. And that's what they mean by with osseous meaning bone, labral, uh, the labral uh, structure in the shoulder and the cartilage of the joint have all been injured. And then finally, he recommends a CT of the shoulder for more sensitive characterization of the bank art and hill sacs lesions. And so this is a really important concept because in patients who have recurrent shoulder instability and dislocations, you can get further bone damage to the shoulder. And really the best way, in my opinion, to evaluate and measure that and to help determine what the treatment will be uh, is to get a CT scan. And you can actually get a CT with three-dimensional reconstructions of the shoulder, and you can do some very precise measurements of that that help you decide the correct surgical management. And so the CT, just to hit it one more time, remember when we have our shoulder socket and then the defect on the humeral head, that keeps coming out of place, and it's just uh, a positive feedback loop. It just, uh, the more it happens, the more the bone wears out, the more likely the uh, shoulder's gonna dislocate, and then that just keeps happening in a vicious cycle. So hopefully in this video, we've been able to go over lots of different types of pathology and explain a lot of the different types of injuries that can occur in the shoulder. In this uh, video, these particular patients tend to be on the younger side, uh, very active, playing sports, things like that, and they sustain shoulder injuries. Um, this is different than our part one video where patients tend to be older in their 40s, 50s, and 60s and above, and a lot of the findings in that video are not necessarily traumatically related and more like age-related, progressive wear and tear type of issues that come up. And so hopefully in these, in these two videos, we've been able to really cover a broad spectrum of pathology that we can see in, uh, in the shoulder and help you guys understand that a little bit better when you review your own MRI report.